Welcome back, everyone, to the fifth and final part of our look at Frederick the Great. Hope you've been enjoying this series as much as I have been enjoying it, and uh, I've learned a lot. I hope you have, too. As always, the link is in the description, not only to the first episode, if you want to catch those first four episodes before watching this one, as well as the link to the original content creator. Let's go ahead and dive right in. Everybody's been telling me I'm going to really enjoy this, so I'm really anticipating something good here. The Battle of Pauline. June 18th, 1757. Frederick's army is running. The year before, he'd invaded neutral Saxony, forcing its troops into his military and snatching the treasury to fund his war effort. Then he'd struck into Bohemia to besiege Prague, but the Austrians caught him there, causing him to split his forces in order to meet the oncoming army. He had struck at them first, as was his style, utilizing his signature oblique attack, where he concentrated his forces on one side of the enemy line. But his troops had been baited into attacking too early, before they were ideally positioned. His frontal assault had melted under Austrian firepower, an element not emphasized in his tight marching formations, and now, hours later, the Prussians have lost nearly 14,000 men, and they've had enough. So... We've been talking a lot through this series about how the general attitude was that attacking is almost always going to be better. And so if you know that, if you know that that's the attitude that your enemy is likely to have, then it seems to make sense that if you can goad him into attacking, you can create an advantageous position for yourself by drawing him out and drawing him into what he thinks is a solid situation, but may be very one-sided. So it seems like that's what's happening here. Rascals! Frederick strikes out with the flat of his sword, shouting at a retreating unit, Do you want to live forever? It's a strange choice of phrase, because while thousands of troops have died for his ambitions, it's actually Frederick himself that will, in fact, live forever. So... It makes me wonder if, I'm, I'm sure other people have spoken that phrase throughout history. It's probably hardly unique to this moment, but I can't help but think of the Battle of Bellow Wood uh, and Sergeant uh, Dan Daly of the U.S. Marine Corps, who is a two-time Medal of Honor recipient already when he shows up in France during the First World War, and he says the exact same thing. Come on, you sons of bitches. Do you want to live forever? Thanks so much to Ground News for supporting today's historical tale. The Third Silesian War would give Frederick some of his most legendary victories on the field of battle, but also his most catastrophic defeats, with Prussia nearly being wiped off the map. But these battles were not just important militarily, mind you. They also formed a sort of proto-nationalism, where civilians at home were following, analyzing, and reading commentaries of his battles almost as they would a sport, but more dramatic. And that fact really got us thinking in the old extra history lab, because unfortunately we don't have time or budget to go through all of his 16 battles, but thanks to my illustrious cat's wonderful suggestion, perhaps we would have the ability to fill you in about it through a different performative art form. Sports entertainment. Okay, extra historians, let's get ready to rumble! Oh man. Hey there, folks at home, I'm extra history narrator Matt. And I'm casual wrestling fan Matt, sup? And we'll be your commentators for tonight. And you know what a night it is in the EH arena? You said it, Cash Matt. If you remember last week, Frederick invaded neutral Saxony, a move so aggressive it spawned a four-on-one match. Prussia against Russia, France, Sweden, and the Habsburgs, leading much of the Holy Roman Empire. You know, you can only hope that this territory grabbing and attacking neutral allies won't serve as some sort of precedent for future German leaders, but wait, oh, dang, there's the bell. Won't serve as precedent for future German leaders. All right, opening moves. The Russians have invaded East Prussia. Sweden has entered Pomerania. Oh, big hits. France and Austria are dancing into core Prussian territory too. Huh, looks like a partition of Prussia. Oh my! Frederick has smashed into the French army double his size. 10,000 French casualties to only 1,000 Prussian. Wow, that's Yikes. cool. Yeah, this they is cool. right out of the ring. Looks like now they're hanging back outside the ropes. But wait, Frederick's dashed over to the Austrians in Silesia now. Again, a force twice his size. Is he jabbing at their left side? Oh, <laughs> sucker punch from the right. Oh, that is a third of Austrian forces gone. I would love to have been in the room when this was pitched as an idea on how to present Frederick the Great's victories during the Seven Years' War. Two major victories in one month. That is impressive. 
But Russia's entered Brandenburg. Looks like Fritz is fighting them off, but... Oh, we were expecting this. Here come the Austrians. Oh, surprise attack! Frederick loses 30% of his army in a strategic blunder. And there is the bell. Time to pause for winter. Indeed, indeed. What do you think so far, Cashmat? Well, I am. I'm going to tell you, I think it's still too close to call, but Frederick has one huge advantage, in my opinion. Three important words. Unity of command. His enemies have to negotiate strategy and coordinate movements between them, communicating with capitals as far away as Moscow, blah, 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 blah. blah. So we talk about this all the time. This seems to be a common theme we talk about, particularly when we're dealing with European wars. Talking about it with the Napoleonic Wars. We talk about it with the First World War. It's going to be an issue in the Second World War. It's when you have multiple allies who are in a coalition force there's going to be egos involved and there's going to be arguments about who should be in command first world war you know is is it going to be the british in command of their own troops or are they going to be under the french command you know how's that going to work they figure that out by the second world war by putting everybody in europe under dwight d eisenhower because they needed that unity of command to be able to take on a force like germany who's all under one commander so the same thing's happening here, and this is a constant issue you have to deal with with coalition forces, which is why so often someone like Napoleon, someone like Frederick the Great can take on a coalition of multiple nations, which in theory should be much stronger. He can exploit those weaknesses. Well, but if Frederick gets an idea, he just gets to do it because he is both king and battlefield general, and that is invaluable. Oh, but that's a disadvantage too. I mean, look at Hokia. A regular general wouldn't have made that mistake. Mm. But since he's king, he doesn't have to listen to his generals. Not to mention his experience at Malvitz. Means he keeps fighting when he should really cut his losses. Fair, 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 fair. But you know what? I tell you who he should listen to is his brother, Henry. That kid is a much more careful general overall. And dude's undefeated, right? Frederick's lost like what? Half his battles? Oh, wait, hate to cut you off, Cash. But it looks like Frederick's talking to the fight doctor about how to overdose on opium if things get worse. Can we get a uh, mic down there? Okay, how you feeling, Fritz? Fortune has it in for me. Fate, she is a woman, and I am not in that way inclined. Let's go. Well, all right. Uh, coming out strong in round two, I guess. Whoops, speak of the devil, there's that bell. Man, they are really on him now. Oh, Berlin is open for the taking. Oh, but wait a minute. Russia and Austria seem to be arguing. They're withdrawing? Boom. Frederick scores a major hit against Austria. Man, though, these fighters, they look exhausted. I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to keep this up. I mean, Prussia's army is down to like 60,000 men. And like, what, the Russians are in Berlin? Yeah, well, this might be the end for... Oh, my God. Empress Elizabeth of Russia has just collapsed. And who's that picking up the crown? Wow, that is her nephew, Peter III, a huge Frederick. Time-honored tradition of being billed from Russia despite being born somewhere else. This is true for, I mean, so many countries. It's not just Russia. Russia is very much a German uh, dynasty as well, just like the British are. Um, and it's not just the Hanover dynasty, right? Queen Victoria, who is the last monarch of the Hanover dynasty, she marries a German prince, Prince Albert. So then the, the line continues to be German after that. Uh, and even now, the the house there in Russia, the, uh, the Romanovs, a lot of that goes back to Germany. Look at Catherine the Great. She was born in what is today Poland, but she was basically Prussian. Uh, a lot of that going on. Frederick fanboy. I even hear he dresses up as Frederick sometimes. That's weird. Yep, Peter III's a weird dude, man. Well, he switched sides, withdrawing Russian troops from Berlin and giving back East Prussia. That... This is one of those moments, right? Think about how differently things go if the Empress doesn't die. If the Russians continue to be on the side of the coalition against... Prussia. Does Prussia ever become a major power? Does Germany ever even exist as we know it today? All because of how and when someone died. Is a miracle. Frederick's made peace with Sweden as well, and now can focus on Austria. Oh man, what a reversal. I mean, now a Prussian-Russian alliance will do- But wait, oh. here comes Empress Catherine with a folding chair! Peter III is deposed! What a slobber knocker! And now she's throwing up the deuces. Russia is out of the war. Wow, what a great move from Catherine. Oh, wow, true that, my friend. I think we're gonna be hearing more from her in the future. I think we're gonna be hearing more from her. By the way, if you haven't already seen, we did do the reaction series to the Catherine the Great uh, 
videos, so I'll put a link up in the uh, on the uh, screen at the end of the video. Now it looks like the ref is bringing out the negotiating table. Oh, yeah, there it is. That is the end. There is the bell. And seven years of war in Europe has ended. Indeed. Tens of thousands dead to affirm that. Check here. Oh, yeah, uh, all the borders go back to where they were before the war. Hmm. Well, that was pointless. Night, folks. So the the main changes that happen then, of course, are in North America, where you basically see France losing most of their North American territories. They're eventually going to get Louisiana back from Spain, but then they're going to turn around and sell it to the United States. Man, I wish I was taught history via wrestling in school. Uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. Prussia survived with its conquests intact, but barely. Plus, Frederick was in no less danger. He'd had six horses shot out from under him during the war, wow. and the years of campaigning had aged him. Shaken by how close he'd come to ruin, Frederick... Oh no, don't, don't show him in a chair, because he dies in a chair. ...would avoid war for the rest of his reign. And, you know, I kind of hate that we're saying it like that. The rest of his reign. Because Frederick actually did so much domestically. But it is hard to balance that story amid his battles. Frederick's rule was one of centralization. As an enlightened absolutist, he believed a strong monarch was necessary to push forward enlightenment ideals in government policy. So some of you have commented and said, is that really not an oxymoron to say an enlightened absolutist monarch? Maybe, but um, compare that to an absolutist monarch in Russia who does not see it as an enlightened thing, does not try to do things that that move along his people and really just kind of advances his own cause and advances the power that are given to the elite. Um, at least it seems in Frederick's case, he's trying to help his country, he's trying to make his country more powerful and more influential, but also put forward the arts and you know things like that with a king as servant and first citizen of the country he reformed prussia's legal code to mostly eliminate torture and mm. repealed most capital offenses so only a handful of executions occurred each year see that's that's why i think you can say enlightened absolute absolutist is a better idea than just a straight absolutist monarch because at least he's doing things that do in fact benefit the common man he opened government positions up to those of lower social ranks and started an organized grain storage program in order to keep food prices stable and provide bread during famines. Hmm. Also, as a patron of the arts, he funded philosophers, artists, and musicians, personally composing 121 sonatas and four concertos with the flute. And when Johann Sebastian Bach visited the court, the two actually had a jam session. That's and cool. All the while <laughs> Can you just picture that? Frederick the Great sitting down with his flute and Bach sitting there with his violin and they're having a jam session together. That is amazing. I'll, he was still prolifically writing histories, poems, and books on battlefield tactics. He also reformed Prussian agriculture by reclaiming Prussian forests and draining swamplands. And while potatoes were already present in Germany as animal feed, he actually recast them as food fit for human consumption. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so... We'll get to this at the end because there's been a lot of stuff that has happened with his body, uh, him being exhumed and reburied, but he's, he's now buried where he originally wanted to be buried as opposed to in the crypt that he was placed for a long time. Uh, I think people leave potatoes on his grave marker. Convincing Prussians that they were valuable by sending royal guards to stand around potato fields. Then in 1772, in one of his most notorious and consequential actions, he managed to avoid a renewed war with the Habsburgs by proposing that Prussia, Austria, and Russia carve up Poland between them, each taking a large piece. Where will we hear that again? Hey, let's share Poland, Germany and Russia, I mean, Germany and the Soviet Union in 1939. Now, there was, of course, no justification for this action, which was against the will of the vast majority of my own ancestors. But in doing so, he did gain the Poland-held province of West Prussia, finally making him there the king go. of Prussia rather than king in Prussia and uniting his expanded territory. Frederick had no children, for obvious reasons, having spent most of his later life with his personal valet, who had a bedroom next to his. And when he died in 1786, at the age of 74, his kingdom went to his nephew, and his body went into a vault next to his abusive father, even though he specifically requested to be buried at Sanssouci next to his greyhounds. 
In death, Frederick left an odd legacy, since his contradictory personality meant people could read whatever they wanted into him. And as we said before, that's true of most historical figures. We, we do such a disservice to history when we try to see everything as black and white, and we don't see the nuance and the complexity uh, in individuals. Everyone is complicated. Everyone has aspects of their lives that when we look at them, they appear to be uh, contradictory to their own principles and contradictory to other decisions that they make. Uh, Frederick's no different in that. German nationalists revered him as a national hero, ignoring that he cared nothing about a wider Germany and despised German language and culture. During the Weimar Republic, Berlin's rising gay culture adopted him as a symbol, and he was also a favorite of Hitler, who justified his expansionism with Frederick's historical example. Yep. Though, to be clear, Frederick had zero interest in ethno-nationalism. His reputation fell as a result after World War II, though historians began reappraising him after German reunification, which was when his grave was finally moved to Saint Souci as he wished. And that's what it says on his, that's all it says. It's, it's kind of like in a script, almost like in cursive. It just says Friedrich der Grosse uh, on his marker. There's nothing else written on it. It's actually pretty cool to see such an important historical figure just have this very plain slab where he's buried but yeah you can actually if you google pictures you can actually see pictures of them uh with his casket sitting out when he was reburied as part of it was right in that time period uh when germany's re reunifying and he kind of became this unification figure although there were a lot of people who spoke out and said why are we glorifying this guy why are we honoring this guy even people within germany but perhaps he received no greater compliment yeah. than that from Napoleon himself, who, when he defeated the Fourth Coalition, paid a visit to Frederick's tomb. Gentlemen, he said, if this man was still alive, I would not be here. If that's not a legacy, that's... I don't know what is. But actually backing up... That is high, high praise coming from Napoleon, and that is absolutely true. That's something that happened. So, ah, fascinating stuff. That was a very unique and different presentation style than they usually do but i think it works it was really cool and it's entertaining so let me know your thoughts use the comment section below uh, i'll throw up the link here if you want to check out the uh, series that i did on catherine the great i'll also put up the link to uh, otto von bismarck which were two other extra history series that i did that relate to germany uh, or to events that are happening around this time obviously catherine the great being in russia uh, but fascinating stuff thanks for watching